good to be with you. Um, let, me, let me give you a little bit of information about myself, just biographical and then um, autobiographical, I guess. And then, and then we'll talk about glory in Romans. So I'm a pastor at Christian Fellowship in Columbia, Missouri. It's a non-denominational church there. Um, I grew up not too far from here. grew up in Huntsville, Missouri, which is just uh, five miles west on Highway 24. I uh, went to college at the University of Missouri, got a teaching degree to teach high school science, realized pretty quickly I don't really care about science. I just want to talk to people about the Bible and about Jesus. And so um, moved to Louisville, Kentucky after um, college at Mizzou and got a seminary degree there. Got a Master of Divinity degree from there. Um, continued on with a doctoral degree in Biblical Studies, New Testament. And so came back to Columbia in 2008 and have been working at the church, did my doctoral degree um, at the same time, finished up in 2014, and somewhere along the way we picked up three kids, four kids. It's been a, it's been a wild week. We have four kids, I do know that, um, ages 11 to 3. Um, a couple other interesting little things about me. Um, my mom actually lives just a couple blocks that way, right on Morley Street, kind of at the intersection of Morley and whatever this road out here is. Yeah, there you go. She's, she's right at the intersection there. So um, I'm going to swing by and see her after this. And then also my wife uh, is a Lang. Her maiden name is Lang. And so Lang Hall actually um, is named after her great-grandfather. So um, you guys, it's a, it's a male dorm, right? Male, yeah. yeah, so you guys probably don't live there. Do you live there? You lived in Lang? Mm-hmm. There you go. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> on behalf of my great-grandfather. <laughs> so, so the title of my doctoral dissertation, what I want to talk to you about this morning, Sharing in Glory. Um, this, is, this is what the whole Bible, all of life, and what um, history is all about, is sharing in glory. The way that I framed it in my doctoral dissertation, which has now been published, if you want to go on Amazon and get it, you can do it. It is fascinating reading, I promise. Um, glory in Romans and the unified purpose of God in redemptive history. And so I want to give you kind of the bare bones version this morning and talk to you for 35 or so minutes and then let you ask some questions if you have any after that. So um, I get to just share some of the fruit of my research. I got to spend a lot of time in Romans during my doctoral dissertation and it's it's a phenomenal book. I got to also spend a lot of time thinking about how Romans fits into the bigger story of the Bible. And, um, and so I love biblical theology. Biblical theology meaning the theology of the whole Bible, the one unified story of the Bible, um, redemptive historical reading of Scripture. That, that if you know those terminologies at all, it's all about the, the big picture. And there's, there's a um, the big picture story Bible for kids, um, which is a, is a biblical theology, redemptive historical kind of story Bible for kids. There's also the Jesus Storybook Bible. Um, which I know you're not kids, but I highly recommend both of those resources because they're, they're really great intros into the big picture of the Bible and how it all centers on Jesus. And that's what I got to spend, um, spend my doctoral years, at least the research and writing and dissertation phase, thinking about. And so um, it's really helpful to see the big picture story of, of the Bible and of life and what God's really up to because then we get to locate our own individual stories in this bigger story. And so that's, that's my goal this morning, is to, this afternoon. This afternoon is to help you with that a little bit. So the big question is, what is the big picture of life? What is God's big story? What's the story of the Bible? And my contention is that the story of the Bible centers on the glory of God, which isn't new. Guys like Jonathan Edwards argued for that long ago. The Westminster Catechism, what's the chief end of man? to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So the glory of God theme is not new, um, but, but the way I frame it, I think, is a little bit different. And so I hope it's helpful for you today. Uh, there's, a, there's a glory theme, the glory of God, that runs through Scripture. Um, the Hebrew word kavod, which, uh, which just means the weightiness or the glory of God. And then the Greek word doxa. Which, um, which we translate glory. And so this theme centered on the glory of God that runs through scriptures, um, that's what I argue is at the center of the Bible, the center of God's purposes, what he's doing in creation and in redemption, uh, because that's what Paul sees God doing in creation and redemption as he lays it out in Romans. So, so I want to begin today, I just want to read from Romans the pinnacle of this glory theme, 
So there's a thread that runs through Romans. Paul ties his gospel to the glory of God, and it run, it's a unifying thread in the book of Romans, as well as in the whole of Scripture. And so I just want to read to open today from Romans chapter 8, which is really the height of this theme as it, as it comes to its heights in the book of Romans. And so Romans 8, I'm going to read just verses 16 to 30, and I want you to hear how Paul talks about glory. Uh, particularly the glory that we as believers in Christ are destined for. So he says in verse 16, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning until now in the pains of childbirth, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. And I'll drop down to verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So I hope you notice the theme that runs throughout there, that our share in Christ's glory, um, that we will be glorified with him, as Paul both fronts it in this section and then closes with that, um, we will be glorified, and talks about it in between. Four times, verse 17, verse 18, verse 21, and verse 30. Paul talks about our being glorified, our sharing in the glory of God or in the glory of Christ. And so we sing a lot about glory in our churches. Um, We talk about glory a lot. We talk about suffering that leads to glory. Um, Suffering that's producing in us a a, a weight of glory, as Paul says, or Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, But glory is kind of one of those words that it can be fuzzy. We talk about glory. We talk about glorifying God. Um, glory awaits us, but what's that really mean? It can be a little bit fuzzy at times. Um, And so, how does Paul, the question I set out to answer, how does Paul conceive of glory in Romans? When he's writing about glory, and not just in Romans, because it's a major theme throughout Paul's writings, when he writes about glory, the glory of God, the glory of Christ, our future glory, what's his conception of it? Not fuzzy, muddy glory, but clear, crisp incredible glory. How's Paul conceive of it? And that's what my dissertation was about. So, so here's the way I think I can, maybe the easiest way to get at it today, um, through sharing a story with you, um, the story, going all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 1-1, and I want to just do a quick trek through the scriptures and lay out the story of creation and the story of redemption for you. Because Paul's understanding of glory, and even what Paul writes here in Romans chapter 8, this is part of a story. When Paul's writing about creation being subjected to futility, but it's going to be set free, this is all part of this grand drama of creation, fall, redemption, restoration that God is at work bringing about. And so I want to just outline that story for us this morning and and I hope you begin to get a clearer picture of what the glory of God is and what our future share and that glory is all about. So here's the way I frame the story for you. Chapter 1, which is really a prologue to the story because this goes before Genesis 1-1. It goes like this. Once upon a time, there existed a being so magnificent so beautiful, so wonderful in every conceivable way that there was nothing to even begin to describe him. Yet, that is. And that being existed as three persons sharing one essence, 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And what were Father, Son, and Holy Spirit doing before creation? I teach an eighth grade Bible class. I love to pose this question to them at the beginning of class, the beginning of the school year. What, what was God doing before he created? Why did he create? And the common answer is, well, he was bored. Or he was lonely. I mean, he's just out there, wherever there is, all by himself. Like, he needed something to do, so he created a world and some people he could talk to. And that's their common answer, to, and which I always anticipate it. I'm always thrilled when they give me that answer because then I get to say, no, that's the wrong answer. God was not bored. He was not lonely because he has eternally existed as a community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the most intimate, most joy-filled, delightful relationship Imagine the, purpose, the person you love hanging out with more than anyone. And just to be around them, you just feel encouraged. You love being with them. That's what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were experiencing from all eternity. The Father is sharing His beauty, His magnificence with His Son through the Holy Spirit. And the Son is reflecting back that beauty, that glory to the Father. That's what's happening before creation. The way Jesus says it in John 17, he says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the creation of the world. So prior to the creation of the world, glory is what's happening. The Father sharing his love and his life to the Son, who is the perfect image of the Father, reflecting that back to God. And it's pure joy and intimacy and delight. Okay, so that's chapter one of this story. Chapter two. This God, out of no sense of lack or emptiness or loneliness or boredom, but actually out of fullness, this God chooses to create. He chooses to share his beauty, his magnificence, his love, to go public with his glory, if you will. That's what creation is all about. The, the glory of God overflows into creation. God paints his glory across the canvas of a physical world for physical beings to see and enjoy and be a part of. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit create a world where they can share themselves, where what they have, this good thing they have going on, where they can bring others in to being a part of that. That's what creation is about, where they can share their love and their life, a world colored with God's essence with God's nature. That's what his glory is. It's God's essence, God's nature put on display. That's the glory of God. That's why there's creation, so that God can share himself. One of my eighth graders said it this way. She said, um, she said, Mr. Barry, so it sounds like to me what you're telling us, this is everything I learned about glory, I said, I learned in eighth grade. She said, it sounds like what you're telling us is that, let me see if I've got this right. She said, God, God is the bomb. And he knows he's the bomb, and he loves being the bomb, and he creates to share his bomb diggity. Is that right, Mr. Barry? And I said, you nailed it. That's, that's biblical theology right there from an eighth grader in a brilliant way. God is the bomb. He's the most amazing, glorious being that has ever existed. And to keep himself to himself, I mean, that would actually be... We could say that might be a selfish act because for God to share himself, he is the one that thrills us to see him and to know him, to see his glory. That is what gives joy to our souls. It's what we were made for. And so God's love and his glory are not opposed to each other. So, well, I love these people, but I've got to uphold my glory. No, the, the centerpiece of his glory is that he shares himself lovingly with us so that we can know him and enter into his glory. That's what creation is all about. Paul's way of saying it in Romans chapter 1. He says in Romans 1.19, What can be known about God is plain to them, plain to humans, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. That's what creation is all about. God showing Himself, making Himself known. And so in creation, God's essence, his attributes, his nature are made visible. They're woven, woven into the fabric of creation. And now with the creation of a physical world where God displays his glory, now we can begin to describe him. We can begin to conceptualize of the one who is inconceivable. 
His beauty is like a sunset. Fire orange that takes your breath away. His generosity, like the trees of Eden, created just to give of their fruit for the good of others. His tenderness, like a soft breeze that brushes your face. His faithful constancy, like the rising and the setting of the sun day by day by day. I mean, all of these are just ways that we can begin to conceive of the glory of God. His greatness, His bigness, His awesomeness. Look at the night sky, look at the stars and say, wow, God spoke those into being. He's amazing. So in the created world, we begin to see God's glory. It's painted across the world around us. And then we come to chapter 3, which is the climactic event of creation. God makes human beings. Those who will inhabit this world which he created to showcase his glory. And those who will in fact be the most vivid expression of his glory. He makes human beings in his image and in his likeness to be like him so that he can share himself with us as he has eternally shared himself with his son so that we can both see his glory and delight in it and also reflect his glory and display it just as the son has eternally seen and delighted in the father's glory and reflected it back to him now we get to enter into this beautiful relationship of seeing and knowing the glory of God and of reflecting it to others and so humans are created in God's image for the person of no, for the purpose of knowing him and showing him And these image bearers are crowned as kings over God's world. If you remember, Genesis 1, 26 says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And then God blesses them and says to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over it. Humans are given the high privilege of being God's representative kings over his kingdom. God is king over his world and we are his vice kings who get to represent him and exercise loving God-like stewardship, causing creation to thrive and flourish. As those who know God's glory and who shine with it, we get to then put our hands to the work of cultivating God's world and creating and building and, and everything we touch we're meant to cause it to drip with God's glory. In our relationships with one another, we're meant to reflect God's glory in our kindness and in our love and in our uh, generosity towards one another. That's our purpose, to see God's glory and to be like Him, to share God's glory and to show Him. It's an amazing story. God has brought us into His story. It's a happily ever after kind of story. But as you can already anticipate, it doesn't go happily ever after. Chapter four, the humans God created to see and share in his glory chose a different path. You're familiar with the rebellion of Adam and Eve in the garden when they believed a lie and turned away from God's glory. God's glory on display. And they say, no thanks, we'd rather have an apple whatever the fruit may have been. So here's how Paul describes it in Romans 1. He says, Romans 1, by the way, Paul is interweaving the history of humanity and Adam and all who are in Adam with the history of Israel because their, their two stories are one, really. And so we'll see that as we go along. But Paul says in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, God's invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and His divine nature, His glory, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, humans, are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Doxadzo. They didn't glorify Him as God as they were intended to. Or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory 
of the incorruptible God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They exchanged the glory of God, the ultimate bad trade. Exchanged the glory of God for images. So, in exchanging God as the object of their worship, they also exchange their share in His glory, their reflection of God. When they turned away from seeing and delighting in His glory to other things, the image of God became marred in humanity. No longer do we reflect the glory of God as we were intended to. And so our relationship with God is broken. Our relationship with others, where we're meant to be a reflection of God's self-giving glory, now our relationship with others are broken. Rather than loving and serving and displaying the self-giving kindness of God, we take, we use, we trample on others for our own advantage. We display something still, but it's not the image and glory of God. And also our relationship with creation is broken. This realm over which we were to exercise godlike dominion and cause everything. I mean, that was the role of image bearers, that, that they would be fruitful and multiply and have lots of children, but not just children, right? Children who were image bearers of God, who would go out of the garden and extend the borders of Eden to the end of the earth until, as the prophet Habakkuk and Isaiah and others say, the whole earth would be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But in turning away from him, what we fill the earth with instead is with brokenness and corruption. Our hearts are in utter disarray. We become futile in our thinking, Paul says, and our foolish hearts are darkened. And so that's this opening section of Romans where Paul reflects on the story of Israel, the story of Adam, the story of all humanity. And, and he comes to this conclusion in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Paul's summary of the current state of things. To fall short of the glory of God is to fail to reflect God as his image bears. To fail to display his character and his nature in our lives. To fail to see his glory and delight in it. And to fail then to show his glory. Because the two are interconnected, right? seeing his glory and shining with his glory. It's as we see him, we become like him. Paul reflects on this in his letter to 2 Corinthians when he talks about Moses going up on the mountain to see the glory of God and God puts him in the cleft of the rock and causes his glory to pass by. Moses just sees the back though. Just a, just a bit of the glory of God and he comes down off the mountain with his face lit up because he's been in the presence of the glory of God. And Paul then says, we now as new covenant believers are the ones who's, who our faces, our eyes have been unveiled to see the glory of God. And as we behold the glory of God, we're transformed into the same image from glory to glory. It's as we see him, we shine with him. But in the fall, we lost our ability to see God's glory and cherish it. And so we cease to reflect his glory as we were intended to. That's the point of the glory theme in the opening section to Romans. Paul says we've exchanged God's glory, we've fallen short of it. And so when Paul says in Romans 8, as we open with, when he says the whole creation was subjected to futility, the creation itself is groaning, Paul's reflecting back on the fall, saying, Creation was intended to be under the wise, loving stewardship of God-like, glory-filled individuals who would steward it and cause it to flourish and thrive the way God would. But now, because we've turned from the glory of God, creation also, and, and we are subject to corruption and futility and foolish hearts and darkened minds, Paul says now all of creation is suffering and languishing under our ungodlike dominion over the earth. So everything's marred. Futility means, he says, our minds are futile. He says creation subjected to futility. Futility just means it doesn't work like it was meant to. So we have tsunamis and earthquakes and droughts and floods and thorns and thistles and weeds and dandelions. But not just that. 
our bodies break down. Cells devour one another. Disease and death and male pattern baldness just setting in. But it also means this. It means broken economic structures. Exploitation and inequality rather than the thriving of everyone. And business is about personal gain at the expense of others. Technology. We create wonderful things, amazing things. Like the internet's incredible. There are lots of amazing things with technology, but it always comes with a downside, doesn't it? There's always the cost. Futility. Government, rather than an extension of God's kingship, caring for others and serving to bring about a flourishing society. Well, you know how politics go. Rivalries and corruption and power plays and self-seeking and nationalism and ethnocentrism and all at the expense of others and at the expense of the good of all. Race, rather than being a beautiful expression of God's diversity and creativity. Discrimination. Hatred, prejudice, war. Education, meant to bring us into a better understanding of our Creator and of His world and of the way things work. Well, now we try to understand the world apart from God. And the more enlightened we become, the darker our understanding grows. Sexuality, we use others for personal fulfillment rather than for the beautiful expression of self-giving love that God intended to reflect His own love and His own faithfulness. Every part of life, you just go down the list, everything has been subjected to futility. It doesn't drip with the beautiful glory of God. It's broken. It's subjected to futility because of our turn away from the glory of God. We live in a world where image bearers meant to rule as God's representatives no longer reflect God's glory in our dominion over the earth. And so we extend brokenness and the ugliness of our rebellion against the Creator. That's the state of things. Chapter 5. So that could be the end of the story right there. God could just wad it up and throw it away and say, that's it. But there's another chapter. God's not done writing His glory across creation. So he determines to set right what's gone wrong and to restore his creation and rescue his people. And so Numbers 14.21, I've already made reference to this, and then the prophets pick it up again and again. Numbers 14.21, God says in, the moment, in a moment of darkness in his people's lives, when they've rebelled, the spies have refused to go into the promised land, they've not trusted the Lord, God tells Moses, God says, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Habakkuk picks that up in Habakkuk 2.14. As the waters cover the sea, the whole earth is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord. Everything's going to drip with it. That's the purpose from the very beginning, why he created, and it is what he will do, what he will accomplish. And so at the center of this plan of God to restore his glory to his people and his world, there's a man named Abraham. God promises through Abraham's seed to restore his blessing to all peoples of the earth once again. And interestingly, Paul in Romans 4 picks up on this promise. In Romans 4.13, 4, Paul says, The promise to Abraham and his offspring was that he would be the heir of the cosmos. And you read that and you think, Paul, don't you know God promised Abraham and his offspring that they would get the land of Canaan? That's, that's, a, that's a little strip of land along the Mediterranean Sea. But Paul sees something bigger there because he sees God's purpose through Abraham's seed that he's going to extend his blessing back to the entire earth, all peoples of the earth. And it's not just about the little strip of land of Canaan. So Paul says the promise was that Abraham and his descendants would be heirs of the cosmos. All of it is meant to be under their dominion once again. Abraham is a new Adam. God is carrying out the same plan that he intended for Adam and his seed through Abraham and his seed. And of course, Abraham's seed become the nation of Israel, who are like a corporate Adam. A people who are to know God, dwell in his presence. God will dwell with them so that they see his glory. And they're to shine with his glory. That's what giving them the law is about. right? The law 
is based on God's character and his nature. God didn't just flip a coin one day, say, hey, we've got a people now. We, we really need some rules to govern these people. All right. Murder. Should that be good or bad? Heads, it's good. Tails, it's bad. Okay, murder. Tails. All right. Murder's bad. Murder's out. No. Okay, adultery. Good or bad? Flip a coin. Okay, adultery's out. Love. Is love good? Love bad? Flip a coin. Okay, love's good. Okay, we got some... No. Why does he give the laws he gives, the commands he gives? Because of his essence, his nature. God is love, and so he calls his people to love one another. God is faithful, and so we are not to commit adultery, but we're to be faithful so that we display the faithfulness of God. God never lies. He is truthful. If he says it, you can count on it. And we as his people who are meant to reflect his glory shall not bear false witness because God is true and doesn't lie, and so we shouldn't lie either. The law was given so that the people of Israel could, by keeping it, shine as a light to the nations, reflect God's glory to the nations. In keeping the law, they would show the nations what God is like. Look at what it's like to know this God and to be in relationship with Him. Look at the way they do things and how different it is. That's the plan and the purpose for Israel. Same plan as in Adam. God displaying His glory through Israel to the nations. But Israel goes the same route that Adam does. They utterly fail. And so Paul in chapter 2 of Romans, I'll just make reference to it, but chapter 2, verses 17 to 24. You can go back sometime and read it. Paul says, the, the, the Jews are saying against the Gentiles, hey, well, yeah, look at the Gentiles. They're bad, but hey, we're the Jews. We've been given the law. We're a light to the Gentiles. And Paul says, okay, you Jews, you Jews who are a light to the, you're a light to the Gentiles because you have the law of God. You do the exact same things the Gentiles are doing, and so the name of God is blasphemed because of you. It's Paul's indictment on them saying, yeah, you were meant to be a light to the nations, to shine the glory of God, and you've done the exact opposite, as have all who are in Adam. But the promise remains. God sends prophets to speak of this restoration of his glory. Isaiah talks about it. Comfort, comfort my people says your God, Isaiah 40, says the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. He says in Isaiah 61, let me just read Isaiah 61 to you because it's a great passage. He says, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising as his glory will be seen upon you. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. That's the plan of God. He begins speaking to his people in the midst of their brokenness and the threat of exile coming. He says, there's coming a day when his glory will once again be seen upon you. His light will shine. And so, it's into this broken world with these unfulfilled promises hanging in the air, with everything out of joint, that a son is born. One who bears the image of God and perfectly reflects his glory. John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. So this is God with us now. The glory of God come near. Jesus, the Son of God, who has eternally reflected the Father's glory, steps into the world to display the glory of God and to restore his glory in us. He's the human king God intended all along, the image bearer who is Lord over creation and begins to put all things under his feet and take dominion once again. He's the true Adam and true Israel who shows us what it means to be truly human the way God intended, to shine with God's glory. And he displays the depths of God's glory, the depths of the self-giving love of God on the cross, where he dies to bear the curse of our sin, all our brokenness and shame and the marring of God's glory. He bears it, rises again, 
and he's resurrected as the first act of new creation. God's new world, new heaven, new earth, where his glory will shine. Jesus is the first act of that new creation. Of all things being set right. And he begins to make us new creation too. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation now. We are part of this new world where we are being once again conformed to the image of God's Son to reflect his glory. So Paul says it this way. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He says, Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and was raised for our justification, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, justified by faith, set right with God, declared righteous, we who are ungodly, who have failed to reflect his glory, he now declares us righteous by faith in Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we've obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It's become our hope once again. It's a reality for us now. The glory of God that we were always intended for, that's what has been restored in Christ. The hope of once again seeing the glory of God and of sharing in it and reflecting it. So let me wrap up by bringing us back to Romans 8. So... Let's just let's look at Romans 8 again in light of this big story. So Paul says in, in Romans 8, verse 17, If we're children, we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. We're heirs with Christ. We will share in His very glory. Well, heirs of what? Heirs of the cosmos. Paul's already said that in Romans 4.13. The promise to Abraham and his descendants that they would be heirs of the cosmos, it's come to us now. And now Paul says, that's the essence of what it means to be glorified with Christ. We will share in his inheritance. We will rule over the cosmos once again. He's already said in Romans chapter 5 that we who have been justified, share in the grace of God, we will reign in life through Jesus. Romans 8, 18. I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us and in us. Actually, in us, I think, is a better translation. Ace there, in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Okay, get that piece. Creation that was subjected to futility, Paul goes on to say. It's waiting, saying, we cannot wait for the sons of God to finally take their rightful rule and to be set right again. Because then what happens to creation? The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When we are set free from our corruption, from all the sin in us, and we shine fully with the glory of God once again, and we rule over creation with Christ as God intended, reflecting his glory in everything we do, then creation too will be free. Our freedom is creation's freedom. The destiny of the two, God set us over creation as vice regents over his world. And so our fall from glory meant creation's fall from glory. But our restoration to glory means creation's restoration to glory. And this is all happening in Christ because he has begun to bring about this new creation. He goes on, drops down a little ways. There, there's great stuff on the Holy Spirit in the middle as the one who brings about this glory in us. Even now this process is at work. But then Paul says in verse 829, we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. For Paul, image and glory are linked. Every time he uses the word image, it's in the context of glory. The two, he can't talk about image without glory because for him, to be in the image of God goes back to Genesis 1. And what was that all about? Us reflecting God, the glory of God. And so we will be conformed to the image of the Son once again, which Paul summarizes in verse 30 as saying, we will be glorified. This is the story that runs through history. 
So Paul can talk in various ways in, in Romans 8 and throughout Romans about glory, various facets of glory, but glory or being glorified is, what he, is the term he puts over all of them. So four facets to this glory. We've already talked about each of these, so I won't expound on them, but glory is an inward ethical thing as he transforms our character and our nature to be like his. Loving, self-giving, Conform to the image of the Son. It's also an outward physical glory. He talks about the redemption of our bodies. Creation is waiting for the full redemption of our bodies. God is going to fit us with bodies suited to ruling over the cosmos for all eternity. He says in, um, in Philippians chapter 3, at the end of Philippians 3, he says, When Christ comes back, our citizenship is in heaven from which we await the Savior who will come and transform our lowly body of humiliation to be like his body of glory. It's a physical transformation where we will share in the very life and incorruptibility of God. It's also a functional glory as we are restored to our rightful rule over creation, ruling as image-bearing servant kings. It's interesting that um, Romans 8, the terminology that runs this creation subjected to futility, the, the terminology is the same as the terminology he uses in chapter 1 of Romans when he talks about how we've, um, our foolish hearts are darkened, we've become futile in our thinking. He's casting Romans 8 as a reversal of Romans 1. And what happened in the fall when we exchanged God's glory is going to be restored when Christ comes again. And then finally, there's relational glory. All of this is a part of this familial relationship that's true for the sons of God, the daughters of God, the children of God, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's in relationship with God and being restored to right relationship with him through Jesus that we become partakers once again of the fellowship of the Trinity, where we share in God's glory. We see it, we know him and delight in him, and we reflect his glory. So I think we're out of time. If we had more time, I'd talk about Romans 12, which talks about how we live the future in the present. Romans 12 also is another passage where the same terminology as Romans 1, particularly Romans 1, 28, um, is reversed. In Romans 1, 28, it says, the creatures didn't even think it fit to approve of the knowledge of God. And in Romans 12, he says, offer your bodies again to God. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you can test and approve. Same word didn't see fit to approve of God and his knowledge, now we're able to approve what is good and pleasing and perfect. We're able to once again delight in his glory, and so we become reflectors of his glory. That's how we live now. That's our purpose, is to live as reflections of the glory of God, to reflect the image, the character, the nature of God, until one day when Christ returns, we will fully reflect the glory of God. We will be like him. Unhindered intimacy with God, ruling dominion over the earth, whatever that might look like. We only get glimpses of it in the scripture. Bodies, outwardly, inwardly, no corruption, just reflecting the glory of God, and it will be glorious. So in summary, well, I'll just let you read those summary statements um, at the bottom. That, that summarizes what we've talked about today, that God has given himself to us that we might share in his glory. That's our part in this big story. One story that runs through the whole of Scripture, and we get to be a part of it. It's an incredible thing. Yeah. Right. Let's take a few minutes. What time do we, what time do we wrap up? When we run out of good questions. All right. Well, when we run out of good questions, we'll be done. So, but don't rush through your good questions. If you have any good questions, take time. If you, I, gave you, I gave you the bare bones outline. As I said, there's so much more you could talk about. Tons of details in here that you might be interested in and probably honestly wouldn't be. Um, but there's such rich stuff related to the glory of God and the way Paul unfolds it in Romans. So any questions about anything we've talked about at all or anything unrelated? I'm glad to, glad to share what I might know. Yeah. So at the very beginning, Mm -hmm. But that was before the fall, mm -hmm. and then um, the glory of God got skewed in 
us bearing that image. And so are we still under that command even as broken and the yeah. of God? Yeah. Can we multiply in a, a broken image? Y- yes. Um, yes, because, I mean, as, as New Covenant, New Testament believers, um, I, I think that's exactly what the Great Commission is about. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's, it's the same command. Go and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And Paul will talk about this in other places. He, he, he links the idea of fruitfulness to the gospel. So he'll talk in Colossians 4. Um, or Colossians chapter 1, he opens and then, and then comes back to it in chapter 4, but about the gospel going forth and bearing fruit and multiplying. And I think it's alluding back to this Genesis text where it's through the gospel now that God is, that, that we're reproducing the image of God, right? As others come to know Christ and are then conformed to his image. And so we, we as the church get to be the living representatives of God on the earth. With the church is meant to be, it's like a, like kingdom outposts in the midst of a broken world where we show the world what the glory of God looks like, what it means to be in Christ's image. And then as we go out and we extend redemption into the, the different parts of the earth, um, we're, we're extending the glory of God, the, the shalom, the peace of God, bringing his image into the world once again. So, so I think it is still ongoing. It's what our call is as human beings. Um, though it's though it's one that will only, I mean, it's a partial thing that won't get fulfilled until Christ comes again. But yet we get to live as prophetic signposts of the future world that's coming and of what that will look like, what it looks like when people prefer one another above themselves, what it looks like when we, um, I mean, Paul will go on in Romans 15 to talk about the Jew-Gentile tensions and about live together for the glory of God with one voice glorifying God, like there, it, it gets worked out in all kinds of ways. So, yeah, great question. And I have a whole. There's an appendix on image and glory in the Old Testament and how the two are conceptually related and come to be. So, so this, I, is, this is a good so doctoral thing. <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. This is all these sorts of things that yeah. you need to think about when you're going. Yeah. And and I wouldn't argue. What I wouldn't. It, so it's a great point you bring up. And what I would not argue is that. Um, is that glory is the only way to frame this story. That you have to, and, and you have to look at the word where glory occurs. It's more, it's, it's, Paul does use glory to frame this story, but it's more of a conceptual story. It's the idea that God is sharing his essence and his nature um, with humans, who bringing us into relationship with himself to know him. And then we, as image bearers, get to be like him. And so if you want to pick covenant, because covenant is a great, I mean, it's one that's been given a lot of attention. Well, what's covenant about? It's about a relationship with God. God becoming the God of his people and his people coming into relationship with him. And, and the covenant, I mean, pick any of the covenants. Pick the covenant with Abraham. Through you, I'm going to bless all peoples of the earth again. God reveals himself to Abraham and is going to extend his blessing that he's giving to Abraham through Abraham to the rest of the world or the covenant with Israel. What's the purpose? That they would know God, live in relationship with him, and then be a light to the nations. It's always this purpose. Of, it's, it's always directed two ways. It's always directed back to God. So here's us. So it's always directed our relationship with God, knowing him, being in relationship, joined to him, but then also are sharing him with the rest of the world, the Gentiles, the nations. And so you can pick lots of centers, lots of ways you can frame it. Frame it in terms of covenant. Frame it, frame it in terms of glory. Frame it in terms of, um, like I, I've done, I love, to, I love to do biblical theology and lay out the big story. It became a joke in our church for a while that, well, we know that all of your sermons are going to start, they're always going to go back to Genesis 1-1, and then you're going to walk us through the whole Bible and then come to whatever text you're preaching on. And because that's what I love to do, to say everything is about God's self-revelation of himself, sharing himself, and our being part of that and getting to share. Now, Paul does use glory in, rela- in, in relationship to this theme a lot. It seems to be the predominant word that he uses to conceptualize it, but there are lots of other words. And different parts of the Bible are going to frame it differently. But I think the heart of it comes back to this idea of, our knowing God, being related to Him, and then our being like Him and getting to share in making Him known. I mean, that's, that's kind of the centerpiece. A lot of people who are trying to do biblical theology now have, I 
actually shy away with trying to make one central theme because there are so many good choices. And yeah. Now, people most often speak of things like threads. Mm-hmm. And since there were you had several streams, recurring themes that yeah. repeat themselves over and over and over again. Uh, I did one on uh, justice and righteousness. Yeah. Uh, those two terms are oftentimes linked together in the sense of God is restoring the cosmic order of things. Mm-hmm. The cosmic order is based on these two words, justice and righteousness. Kingdom of God is another big one. But, but again, I would say kingdom of God starts in Genesis 1, where you have God creating image bearers and saying, rule over it, have dominion. And it's not just, hey, go out and kill animals and eat them if you want to. You can do, you're in charge now. No, it's as my representatives, rule over it in a particular way as those related to me who make the world a certain kind of world. And so you take that theme. I mean, I think they all, they all come back. Righteousness of God has to do with God's character. I've got a chapter on the righteousness of God in the book as well, um, because that's a big theme, justification, righteousness of God. But, it, but it's rooted in God's character, his essence, what God is like, and then him setting us right to be like him once again. So, yeah. It's a different way of doing theology than sometimes with what we think about here. Because, you know, the way our education system is set up, you know, you take a couple of biblical theology, biblical theology courses, but really what they are is systematic theology. Yeah. You take a topic, eschatology, angelology, demonology, yeah. Christology. It's a systematic approach. Okay? This is yeah. a, a different way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. It's a lot more holistic. Yeah, the, and the difference, a big difference. Both are, both are good, and most good theologians yeah. will tell you that you absolutely need both. You need biblical theology combined with systematic theology and vice versa. But systematic theology, kind of, it, it takes it out of the temporal framework and just says, what's everything the Bible says about baptism? We've got verses here, 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 here. We try to pull them together and create this, here's the Bible's teaching about baptism, or here's the Bible's teaching about angels. What's it? What's the whole? Biblical theology is focused on the unfolding story. How does it progress? Where is it, where is it leading to? What's it, how, how do these themes develop? What's kind of the story? It's a it's story. The Bible's a big story that's going somewhere. And so it's a different way looking at it through time. How's this story developed? How's this theme of the kingdom of God developed? Um, and so there, there are two different ways of looking at, at and of doing theology, both of which are really great. Um, I'm kind of partial to biblical theology just because I love the story. I think it's, uh, I mean, the story captures me. It makes me go, oh, that's beautiful. That's amazing. I want to be a part of that. That's what, that gives shape to my life and to my story what I'm about. So, um, yeah, so they are two, two really great ways of doing theology that work hand in hand. Um, but yeah, and I've kind of laid out the one for you. Any other questions? It's Friday afternoon. It is Friday. It's like, let's let us out of here. some of that myself. It took a little while to get everything to match up properly. As and I thank you because if yeah. you weren't here, I was going to have to do something. <laughs> there you go. So you get the day. I really yeah. do appreciate you bailing me. Yeah. Really yeah, glad uh, to. Um, and certainly for expounding upon that. It, it's a definitely a workable theme uh, through a lot of that. Yeah. You should run to Amazon, buy a copy, because I think I get like six cents from every book, and I'm going to get rich off of this. And so, yes. fund as, my. As, fund most, my <laughs> as most theologians tend to do. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Lots and lots of money. Once I hit millions, and the new copy comes out that says New, new York Times best selling author. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, you should be happy. Usually, dissertations get like two or three reasons. Yeah. Maybe I will get a, a handful more than that. But yes. Yeah. Especially but it. But I love coming. I love getting a chance to, because it, it can be kind of technical the way it's written. And I mean, it, it's not easy reading. My dad tried to read it and gave up pretty quickly. Just because he's my dad. He's like, I'm going to read it. And, no, you're not, dad. <laughs> so he gave up. But, but I love getting to break it down the way I did for you guys today and kind of just presenting, presenting the high points. And um, so thanks for letting me come and share with you. I hope it's been helpful. So appreciate it. <laughs>